small boys and observations one to thirty decline. fill in this table. So we've got six values here in the first for the first switch and then we've got another six values for the second switch. So this is a, a systematic way of testing your model. So okay, let me just let me just do the first one with you and then you can read the other values off the table for me. <laughs> okay, so uh, so for observations I'm going to, let's, we said we're going to exclude 31 to 54. Uh, we're going to exclude those observations. My x space is my, my wavelengths. My y space are my three, uh, uh, three trees types. six components, right? And then if you go to analyze, well first we should always, always check the score plot just to make sure we've got no major outliers. And then they're all, all, all basically within the scores uh, for the SPE as well. Most of the observations, well all the observations are there. Uh, so now we go specify a prediction set. Edit. Prediction sets. So there's my RMSEE and my RMSEP. So here's, here's this unusual case where you've got your root mean squared error of predictions smaller than estimation. So that's, that, that does happen sometimes. It's not, it's not guaranteed that the one is smaller than the other. So RMSEP for spruce is 5.3 and RMSEP is 4.3. 4 and then what I just want for you or someone to read for me the corresponding values for the other. So there's pi there, and there's pi here. So let's say pi is 5.1, and RMSEP for pi is 4.0. Okay. The other one that I preferred, yeah. uh, so we had the prediction error of uh, 2.447, or sorry, 477. 2.5 and then and the other one was 1.1. Well, three times that we get. Uh, other, other way around. Other way around. Oh, well. yeah. ah, okay. For label law back. Okay. 1.1 and 2.25. There we go. Okay. Did anyone have a chance to switch the data sets around yet? So I'll give you a minute or two to do that. Just get those values we will do our final comparison. There's something interesting about this data. So
because this one spreads it out around. So the models are actually, they're in slightly different directions, and that's not unusual to see when you do your test set split. There's, you often get kind of agreement with the first few models, but then things start to diverge after that. The other reason why these two data sets, uh, this is the split is so different, is because the design of experiments used down here in the second half, 31 to 54, was a very different design. It didn't quite have the range of variation as the first design. The second half of the design, um, I guess, I don't know if I can get back to it. Is there a way to get back to that? The thing where you kind of look at the raw data and you move your mouse around with it? The only way I know is just starting all over and importing the data. Does anyone find another shortcut? Uh, you go to the data line for uh, Oh, I know. It's okay. The data line for Xbox. Oh, that's just yeah. what's in the iPhone. Oh, well, I think she made a mistake. Okay, why? Observations 1 to 30. No, why are there 80 on observations? Oh, God, okay, so no, this is the big mess. Uh, <laughs> okay, no, well, maybe, maybe it's, it's kind of, you can see it here. Uh, I think the green, the blue, green, and, and uh, blue, black, and green lines up here represent the data from the latter half of the data. You can see the range of variation is, is quite a bit smaller than the range of variation on the first half of the data set, which is one of the reasons why we're getting this discrepancy, that there's less, it, it spans less of the space. Okay? But that's why I, 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 I advocate this test set switch that you do this because you're going to pick up these issues. Because in real life, when you implement this as a soft sensor, you will see this sort of thing in practice. A model that was working really well will start to deviate after a period of time, or if things change in the process. That model is only as good as the, the, the data that was used to build it. Okay? So as I was talking to uh, during the break there, these are data-driven models. They're relying on the input data. If things change in your process so that the data isn't consistent anymore with your training set, you're going to start to get deviations. Okay? So maybe what I'll do, on that topic, there's just in your in your notes and soft senses, just just jump ahead to this plot over here. Uh, here's a here's a concrete example of that. So we looked at this data earlier. This is the Petro Canada data that I, I started a section up. And what had happened is I got the data from Petro Canada. I was working with them up till here, basically August 2003 was when. I got the data set from them. They gave me data from up to, uh, sorry, from some earlier time up to August 2003. I think I data for about a year and then and a couple of months. Okay, so you're seeing the first, the, uh, sorry, the last eight months of the data that I had. I had a few just a bit more up here. So I called that part A. I built the model for them. I wrote up the report and it worked really well. And then they, they wrote back to me and said, well, we tried to implement it online. So they tried to implement it online somewhere around here. They said it was giving them errors, like they were getting high SPDs and stuff. So what I did is I took that model that I built for them, and I showed what would have happened if they had put it online right from there. So this was training data all the way up to this, this vertical line. And then from this point, August 2003 on, it's, it's testing data. So this is how the model would have worked. You're seeing here the lab values as red dots, the PLS predictions is the black line, the green line is the lead vapor pressure using there and on the okay. So there's general agreement here as it goes through. T squared below the limit. Except for this period of time, which is indicated by the black line, they shut the plant down for a small period of time. Something went offline that the whole unit was down. Okay, so T squared is just way up uh, through the roof there because all the, all the numbers are totally different. SPE as well, above the, the 95%. <coughs> I think this is the 95% data. Okay, so the dash black line up here is 95%. So they turn the plant back on, SPE comes back down. They keep going through August, September, October, they, they kind of just touch the 95% line. But after November 2003, they're above SPE. 
So yeah, I've shown predictions here, but those predictions really should not be relied on. SPE is above the plane for all of November. Then if the plant comes back in for a short while during December, then it's kind of above and below SPE so much. June to July is plant shutdown time again. They clean out the entire distillation column. They go to every tray, they wash them out. They bring the process online and it's still out of control, right? So things have changed in the process from the period of time I built the model to when they actually want to use it. So now you're saying, well, is POS really a useful model here? Right? If I'm going to apply it, I'm going to do all this work, I'm going to put it online, it's only going to last for like three months. What's the point of doing all this work? Well, it just illustrates the point that that, that model is, <coughs> is data driven. If the quality of that input data is poor or is different from when we built the model, we're going to need to do some work. Okay? We're going to need to do some work to keep the model up to date. And there's automated ways of doing that. What we do is, what have happened is some of the variables when we built the model originally, so let's take any particular variable xk. When we mean set it and scale in the training phase, here's mean of zero. So after mean centering and scaling, this is the data here. So it's moving around this area. Come August 2003, this variable starts to drift up. Okay? So even though I can <coughs> center and scale it, it's always going to have some offset. Right? And then that goes through when we calculate t is equal to x times w star. Our x now is always positive. Our t's are going to get large. And then when we calculate our prediction of x hat, and we go calculate the residuals, we're going to get high SPE consistently from that. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to accommodate this drift. So one way people do do things with these samples <coughs> is they their mean centering vector is continually adjusted in a moving in a moving average sort of way. So you're always then going to basically pull this data back down, and or, or another way of looking at it is you're accommodating for that drift in the variable. Same thing happened uh, on another occasion when they shut down the plant and they come back. The mean centering and the scaling vectors that I used pre prior to that plant shutdown were now totally different. So one thing to do is after the plant shutdown, wait for a couple of hours for things to stabilize, recalculate the mean centering and scaling vectors, and then use those updated values in your POS. <laughs> I showed them, I showed them this and we, I showed them the potential for it, but we never actually went on and, and did it, did the work. That's why this is a project for someone. Oh. I've got the data, if someone wants to work on this as a course project, it's, it's up for us. Okay. okay, so these two references I strongly recommend reading. Then this first one just describes a nice systematic way of going through the procedure of building a soft sensor. The paper by Preston Marlin and McGregor was one of the first papers in this area to, to look at soft sensors and, and also describes some of the cautions of using it. So I'm going to look at some of those next. Well, I'll skip over these slides. This is really just for you for reference for the future. How do you build a soft sensor? How to apply it online? These are the detailed steps if you want to go put this online what you follow. You clean your data, you do any calculations, you've got calculated variables in your data set, calculate your x nu, pre-processing, calculate t from x times w star, <coughs> calculate x hat, calculate the residuals. Once you've got the residuals, you get SPE. If you're below the limit, you go ahead. If you're not below the limit, figure out from the contribution plot why. Why is my SPE high? Is it something like this that's causing it? Do I need to update my model to get SPE low? Or is there really a problem in my process that I, that I am, am not aware of? So that's why soft sensors from the PLS approach are great, because you, you get a, kind of a free monitoring model out of it as well, from SPE and from T squared. If T squared is below the limit, you keep going. If not, investigate the contributions to T squared. Make your predictions if you're below the limits. Y is equal to TC transpose. 
and then unpreprocessed your predictions back to real world units. So this prediction here is being pre-processed units, you need to get back to y hat in, in the real world units. When you first implement this model online, you should always check your predictions against the lab values. Okay, so initially you may have to actually make the lab work even harder than they used to be used to working in the past. Because you now want to make sure your predictions from the model match the labs closely. And then you never get rid of the lab, as I said earlier. You always keep checking, so maybe once or twice a week against that lab value. Because that check is going to tell you when you need to go and update your model again. Now one thing to note up here, that this is not really any, any reported in any of the journal publications that I've read, but one thing that's, that's nice to do in practice is, let's say you do get an SPD above the limit or a T squared above the limit, and you do your contribution plot and you figure out it's two or three variables causing the problem. One thing you can go do is just go set those variables as missing values. And then go back to step over here. <coughs> go back to step one. Now you kind of let those variables have no influence in the model. Pre-process your data, calculate your t using the rules for calculate x times uh, t times x w star. This is a shortcut when there's no missing data. When there is missing data, you have to use a slightly different approach to calculate the scores. But now you've calculated the scores that are not influenced by those outliers, and you can then hopefully calculate better predictions that way. So companies that do this in practice often implement this step. So you don't have to turn off your, your soft sensor just when you get an outlier or some noise coming through. You can still go ahead and make a prediction. Okay, I think we've covered all the this already. So adjusting and recentering. If there's drift in the variable, we'll come back to this, this topic of continually updating your model in real time. So that's called adaptive kernel methods. For those of you looking for an interesting research, uh, project for this course, this is one topic that's, that's very interesting. Um, the, there's several papers to read here, but the key person to look for is uh, Bupinda Dayal's uh, PhD thesis from McMaster. D-A-Y-A-L. And then there's several other references that he mentions in his thesis or in any of his journal publications that would be worth reading. Um, and also, I have a draft paper that I never that I wrote but never published on using this. I can submit that to anyone who's interested. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Another research topic for someone in the class is many processes have multiple products produced on the same manufacturing line, but those products all have slightly different properties. So you're using the same X data, but that X data comes from raw, uh, from grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. Let's say you've got four grades being produced on, on the line. Your Y that you're interested in predicting is the same Y amongst all the grades. Okay. Can you get by with one predictive model that covers all the grades, or can you sometimes get by, or do you have to go and build a PLS model for all four grades separately. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. There's a good uh, project in this topic. Sometimes you can just mean center the data and scale the data for grade one, mean center and scale the data for grade two, three, and four, and then combine those pre-processed data together and build one PLS model from the pre-process -pro pre separately but build the model on one data set. So that, that is an interesting topic there. The reason why this is so valuable is the, the biggest problem companies face when they're producing multiple grades is determining when the transition is complete. Because as they're transitioning from one grade to the next, they're usually scrapping that material. Because it's neither grade one nor grade two. But they need to be able to tell when the transition is, is over so then they can say, okay, now start packaging this material as grade two if the transition is complete. So can they switch really uh, can you tell when you've done the switch completely? And secondly, can you run the model backwards and look at how you can maybe make that transition faster? Okay. So some interesting topics in that anyone can look at. And this is a, 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 a project that you can do by simulation. So you've got a MATLAB or a G-Prompt or an ASCII simulation. 
you can run it at different rates, collect your data set, and then uh, go from that point. So it's important. That's a, to me, that's a, that's a nice thing to find in this part. Okay, uh, just some other cautions here. The paper by Krista Marlon and McGregor, as I mentioned, is, is really worth reading. What they did in that, in that uh, article was they simulated data. So they, it was a distillation column. They used a simulator to generate a data set to do, the, to do the work in the publication. And one of the topics they look at is the issue of missing data. What they did is they built a, a model, a PLS predictor, and they built a linear regression model predictor. Now, with linear regression, what can you do if the data go missing? You can delete the you can delete the title, but then you're not going to make any prediction. But let's say this is a critical value, and you want at least some estimate. Use the previous sampling instance. One suggestion Matt says fill it in. Fill it in with the average. And that's exactly what they did over here. So here the black squares. This shows what happens when a critical variable in the model goes down and they replace it with the mean. And you go ahead and keep using least squares regression. Whereas the, the little plus symbols indicate the PLS model performance with that same variable missing. So PLS can go ahead and keep making the prediction because it's being helped by the other variables in the model to impute and continue on with that prediction. The other point and we kind of covered this in the case study here on the, on the sawdust. You need to have adequate variation in the data set. So in the publication here, they showed a case where they generated the X matrix when only the manipulated variables were being used in the, in the, in the data. In a simulator, they only had the manipulated variables being changed and varied. And the effects of the disturbances in the control loops were not changed in the simulation. So basically they used rows in their X matrix that <coughs> never had any disturbance variation coming through. And you build your model on that. And this is the, 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 the best model that you could get. So you go and build your model on the case when you've got no, you're saying there's no disturbance variation, but then you go and test it on data where there really is disturbance variation. Right, because that's how it is in reality. There's disturbances coming into your process. So you're going to get pretty poor predictions. Contrast of, to the case where, obviously, you, you're introducing the variation in the manipulated variables and the disturbances when you train your model. That model is now going to capture the full range of variability that's going to be used by your process in practice. So that, that prediction quality is obviously much better. So that's a that's a that's a, a well-known concept from time series analysis, right? So you need to excite your process and you and move it around, and the data you use to build your model needs to capture all that variation in the same way that you're going to apply it in practice later on. Now, with soft sensors, when we go, that's why I say look at calibration versus soft sensors. When we build a soft sensor, we usually just go back to our historical data set. And we just take whatever data is available. But that historical, just normal happenstance operating data may not cover the full range of variability that we're going to see in the future. Whereas a calibration model usually does. When we go and do calibration, usually we're doing a calibration to predict a certain concentration. We'll change that concentration from the lowest all the way to the highest value. We intentionally manipulate our data sets. The same way here with the the pine, the spruce, and the birch data. If you go look at those Y variables, they go all the way from 0% to 100%. They cover the full range of variation. So the predictions are excellent, as we saw there in the model. But if you don't span the full range of variation, obviously your predictions in the future are going to be poor. And then the final caution that uh, that paper talks about, and this is actually quite interesting. If you go and build that model, your PLS soft sensor model on training data <coughs> the process is operating in open loop. You've turned off your feedback controllers, you go build your PLS regression model, 
These are the coefficients over here with the, with the triangles. Okay. So these are your input temperatures. You're using the temperatures from tray 1 to tray 42 to predict your, your Y value. Then you take another data set and you now that data set is from data collected under closed loop control. Just the ordinary feedback PI loop control and you, you fit your PLS model, you're going to get coefficients in your regression model that are is shown by the, by the x's. What do you notice about those two regression vectors? Okay, so they look kind of lag and push <coughs> further down the column. So the different the different uh, the two the two models are using information more or less from different parts of the column. So one putting more more weight on the up <coughs> part of the column here, whereas this uh, the open loop model shifts the weight to the lower to temperatures down. The other thing that's actually quite worrying is to see the flip here. Okay, this is not a cause and effect model, so that's not too worrying. But the thing is, still at the end of the day, this is going to bug you. It's saying one model when I'm open, operating open loop is putting a positive coefficient on these tray temperatures and it's putting a negative coefficient in closed loop on those. Okay, and then it flips around again over here. That's actually expected because the way a feedback controller works is it's applying negative feedback control to keep the process stable. So very often then the <coughs> dynamics of the process change their sign. Uh, actually, in fact, that was Dr. McGregor's PhD thesis was on that topic. So that it is expected that this happens, but it's also something to be aware of. If you go and build your model on open loop data and then you expect it to work well in closed loop operation, again, the process is very different in open loop versus closed loop. The relationships between the variables are very different. The correlation structure has changed. So you need to go rebuild your model. So how would you do it in practice? Let's say your boss asks you to build an, an inferential sensor for a process. And he or she's asking you, I want a soft sensor on this process, but right now, um, sorry, put it this way, they want a soft sensor on the process with the ultimate aim of putting it in feedback control to keep that variable stable. Right? That's one of the reasons why we build soft sensors, so we can monitor the process and then we can control it. But let's say there currently isn't feedback control on the process. Currently, you're just producing a product and you're hoping for the best. You sell it to your customers. But your boss is saying, well, we can do better than this. Build a soft sensor for me that can predict that Y so we can put it in feedback control. You know this problem exists. So what can you do about it? You know that if you're going to build a model on open loop and then you go and try and apply it in closed loop, immediately the moment you close the loop on your electronic uh, your automatic feedback control, your whole correlation structure is going to shift around in your process. <laughs> you, you have to suck it up. You just build, close the loop, let the correlation structure change, reacquire the data, and rebuild the model. And, you, and, and that's, this, uh, this paper shows that. Uh, they uh, operated open loop and closed loop, and then they had to rebuild it uh, two or three times, and then it converges. So you're, every, every time you rebuild the model, you get a slightly different set of coefficients now. And eventually, because when you, when you, you go from open loop to closed loop, you're going to get the biggest change. But then when you now apply a closed loop, uh, your model that was built on closed loop data, your first closed loop model, you're going to reintroduce different dynamics now because your feedback controller is seeing a, a different Y predicted from a different model. And you and have to re-implement your PLS model the third time perhaps to get it to stabilize. Okay. So again, another re interesting research topic for anyone that's got a G problems or an Aspen simulator ready for them to do that. Okay. So you're all looking pretty tired. I don't think I'm going to hit the next section because I don't think we're doing anyone any good. I know.